Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode here on the Wandering Scribe and Wandering Quill YouTube channel. I am your host, Gabriel Garcia, always known as the Wandering Scribe and the Wandering Quill. Today, we have another author interview today. And this one I am very excited to have on this podcast. My guest today is an up and coming author whose debut novel, Invictus, will be releasing later next week. Invictus follows two titular characters, one being a demigod in a period in Roman history which sees the transition of the Western Roman Empire into medieval Europe as we know it. However, in Invictus, that may be up to grabs as not only the demigod has to find his place in this new world, but an aging Roman general now sees himself on the world stage as the harbinger to bring back what it meant to be Rome and the glories of the Roman Empire. To tell us all about Invictus is the author himself, Chris Hatchett. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Gabe. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm really excited to uh, be on your podcast and um, be, be on the author interview with you. Um, so thank you so much for having me. You're welcome, Chris. Now, is it uh, Chris um, Hackett? I didn't want to make sure I pronounced your yes. last name right. Yes. Yeah, Hackett. Yep, that's it. And um, I'm happy to, should I do a quick intro now? With that? Absolutely. So tell okay. us a little about yourself and sure. how you brought Invictus to the literacy world. Sure. So um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I've lived in New Jersey. I'm um, in the United States most of my life. I'm just a little background of myself. Um, I have a master's degree in biotechnology, so nothing to do with history or anything like that. So my, All right. my, my day job is um, very separate from, <laughs> from, from writing. Um, but I've been writing since I was very young. Um, and uh, I have a passion for both history and writing and reading. And um, Inv Invicta, Fall of Rome was um, a story that I conceived when I became briefly obsessed with the collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, ah. That specific time period interested me because um, there's so much lack of clarity around what exactly happened. And you, you have you right. know, the traditional Edward Gibbon model, um, of, right. you know, kind of a very cataclysmic collapse. Um, and then you've got more modern historians who think, well, maybe it was more of a transition, right? And so um, I read a whole bunch of uh, nonfiction, just kind of um, historical accounts by various uh, individuals um, leading up to when I started wanting to write this. And I, I love fantasy, I love fiction. And so I decided, why don't I try and bring this era to life with kind of a fantasy story? And um, that's that's sort of how, how it came to be. And you know, around the same time, I was really obsessed with, um, you know, Game of Thrones and that whole um, that whole style of fantasy. So I thought, why not bring it, bring the era to life with kind of a, an array of characters. Um, so while you do have the typical hero's journey with the main character, Orophis, who's the demigod that you mentioned, um, you do also have these other characters, such as an aging um, senator and the, the general that you mentioned, Aeschylus, who um, through their eyes, we get to kind of see the lens um, or through, through the lens of their eyes, we get to see really that kind of this transitionary period of the Roman Empire and antiquity really becoming this kind of medieval European um, era that we all recognize with the castles and the moats and knights and all that. Um, so that's kind of how, how I conceived of it. And, and I hope that it'll resonate with the readers. Yes, that actually is very interesting. And the Roman Empire, especially the later half of the Roman Empire, I feel does not get a lot of scholarship or recognition or if it does we only look at you know the barbarian migration yeah. the collapse of the third century or the christ of the third century um there's a whole lot of other facets that go into it and i'm actually glad you brought up uh gibbons because uh for those who don't know uh, gibbons has written several uh books about the fall of rome and it is very cataclysmic that it was like the destruction of western civilization as we know it and brought into the uh, term the Dark Ages, which for a long time was generally accepted as the transition of late antiquity into early modern, or I should say early medieval uh, Europe. But as you mentioned also with more recent scholarship, we have this sort of new look on Rome, which is like, well, Rome doesn't collapse, it's just 
the centralization of Rome just fell. Like what it meant to be Roman survived in the Visigoths, the Vandals, the Alans, the Germanic tribes, everything survived. So I like how now we see, as you printed in your story, that we're going to see this world of this twilight period where now the Western Empire is now going to transition and change. And you have this other character that now has to establish where they are in this world. So I imagine when you began writing this and other series of revisions, you wanted to tell people that, hey, I'm working on this new book and I want to get it published. So what was the initial uh, feedback like in terms of like, oh, you're writing a book and oh, it's going to be about this? Yeah. So, I mean, friends and family were, were always very supportive. You know, not all of them have the passion for history that I do. So right. the, sometimes it goes a little, you know, oh, yeah, ancient Rome, yeah, gladiator, you know, that kind of thing. They don't really, um, you know, sometimes uh, when people aren't very into history, they don't kind of appreciate that that specific period I'm talking about. But I do agree with you that that specific era is not covered a lot in fiction or really nonfiction. It's just kind of absent, you know, but certainly in fiction, you don't see much, I think, because we're not sure what happened. There's not right. Um, but the my friends and family were certainly supportive. Um, but, you know, I this is actually my my this is my first fantasy book, but it's actually uh, my second book. I had um, I, I self-published another one, which was a, a science fiction um, book. So Ooh, OK, I was able to take my lessons from that and uh, and adapt it to this. But that was my first one. So there was a lot more kind of fanfare with my friends and family around that one. Um, and it's also a lot more accessible because it's kind of a comedy sci-fi. It's a very kind of, you know, anyone can pick it up and read it. Um, this is a lot deeper, um, a lot more meat to to the substance of, of, of this type of book, right? It's a historical fantasy. So it marries the, the history, but also the, the fantasy elements. Um, and so... But the friends and family were very supportive. Um, the editor that I hired for my prior book, I did maintain for this book as well. Um, you know, she was very interested in ancient Rome. So um, she she really enjoyed this book. And, and um, to the point where she told me, um, you know, I, I should have led with this one. Um, but unfortunately, I wrote this one second. So um, it came out second. Um, but people were very, very supportive and excited about the book coming out. Um, and, you know, no, no one's really read it yet other than a few beta readers and the editors. Right. So the feedback I've received has been, you know, limited to friends and family, beta readers and the editor, um, although ARCs are now out there. So hopefully I'll start getting some feedback from those um, in, in, in the coming weeks. Um, so nice. hopefully that answers, that answers your question. Yes, definitely. I'm actually glad you brought up um, uh, beta readers as well as um, the ARC books, because that actually leads into uh, my next question, which is... Um, when you began writing this and you began sending um, the beta reads out in the art copies or beginning the art copies, what is something that you hope readers will see in your uh, story? What is a promise that you're making to them in this story that's going to be different from your previous story? Yeah. So so two things. Um, the first one is I, I obviously I really want it to be an entertaining fantasy story. So, you know, first and foremost, I want people to be taken away from the world as it is right now, enjoy the fantasy of it and enjoy the, the you know, kind of the world that was forged. Um, so that's number one, you know, I really hope that they enjoy that. Um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit, you know, kind of the, why I went with a demigod and, and, and all that. Right. Um, at this, also, um, I really want people to hopefully come away from this and think, wow, you know, there was a lot of thought put into this with the, the historical framing of it, right? Because mm. I spent, you know, hours and, and possibly months and years of my life reading about um, the fall of Rome, even before I planned on writing this book. And all of those lessons I, I put into this, you know, kind of the transition to Christianity and, um, you know, the, the transition of the, the civic structure that was the Roman right. Empire into these kind of little principalities and, and how that sort of formed. Um, and so a lot of that, you know, through the eyes of a fiction book, which, you know, obviously it's not, it's not going to be as dry as a textbook, I, at least I hope. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's certainly, uh, I hope people will come away with an appreciation for, um, you know, the history of the era too. You know, even though it's a fantasy story, you know, I hope that they'll, I, I almost want the era itself to be a character in the book. You know, I want people to come away. Right. With, you know, you know th this is, it's interesting how, you know, different it is 
to today, but yet similar in some of the ways that people were thinking about what was happening to it, right? Um, right. You know, people who lived through it, and you know, there's firsthand accounts that you can draw from and, and build these characters based on. Um, so hopefully that's what people, those two elements are what I really hope people see from it. Awesome. And from the uh, response from your beta readers, do you feel that they've sort of gotten that uh, feeling? Um, what was the response like from your beta readers in terms of like, you know, the story, the characters and overall themes? I, I think that, you know, overwhelmingly, my beta readers really enjoyed the Roman world that was built. And that was something that multiple of them said, you know, that they, they really enjoyed how I, I made this world co come to life, this sort of uh, almost uh, apocalyptic, but not quite seeming in the eyes of the characters, um, right. world that was transpiring. Um, but then also in parallel, you know, they really enjoyed the, um, the fantasy that was built into this because this was not a, uh, you know, this, the fantasy was not an afterthought, you know, it's kind of built into why did Rome fall? And, and that question, right. I built sort of this fantasy element into that very question. And so they really kind of appreciated that. And, um, you know, what I want people to really come away with is almost the thought of, you know, maybe there was magic in the ancient world, which, you know, now today in the modern days, it's gone. Um, but, you know, maybe uh, once upon a time, um, it was there and maybe that was part of part of the fall. So awesome. Awesome. And I can tell, as you said, you've done a lot of research into like sort of like the formatting, making sure the history that it feels authentic, that this is, you know, late Western Empire Rome. It's going to be fictitious in some elements, but it's going to feel very organic. And so with that in mind, did you have a particular uh, reader? for this story or did you write this for yourself in the sense that this is a book that you yourself would want to read or buy? This was a book that I myself would, would want to read. Um, absolutely. You know, um, I, I, I absolutely made this from the perspective of, you know, again, I was watching Game of Thrones and, you know, these, these kind of stories where um, magic was part of the world, but not the only interesting part of the world, right? Um, and that's kind of what I what I carried forward into Invicta, where there is this magical element, which is super interesting, and, and that's going to be the main you know plot point here. But um, the most the for example in Game of Thrones, there was a lot happening that had nothing to do with magic that was very interesting, right? Right. And that's kind of what I wanted people to come out of with the the fall of Rome, right? Even though there's this magical piece, there's all this drama and intrigue happening that's not related to the magic, but also sort of is. Um, that you know, right. you know, that kind of comes out in this. So it was definitely a book I wanted to read because I like all of those elements. Um, and you know, even even in the more mainstream things like like Star Wars, right? Um, right? I was one of those big fans of the politics stuff happening in the background, even though a lot of people hate it. You know, I always right. loved that stuff. So I brought sort of those sort of things into it. Um, but then uh, I also, you know, the reader I have in mind is is someone who you know enjoyed something like Game of Thrones or, um, you know, Lord of the Rings, but also did enjoy the more lighthearted um, pseudo fantasy like Star Wars, right? Where you don't have right. to have this super meaty, you know, morsel. It's more just you enjoy it for what it is um, and, and you enjoy the world that's been built um, um, as opposed to, uh, you know, necessarily having to, uh, and, and th that goes into the length of the book as well, right? You know, Game of Thrones and some of these books are extremely long. Uh, or you know, I should say a game of ice and thrones, not, not the show itself. Um, right. But that, you know, that's an extraordinarily long book. I purposely made this, you know, within a more reasonable trade established length. Cause I, I want people to, for first off, it's the first in the series. So there'll be more. Mm, okay. Um, but also I, I want, I want people to kind of enjoy that mystery of what else is to come, you know, what happened before. Right. Um, you know, that whole thing. Nice. And before we go to the next questions, I did want to ask, so the title of the book, Invictus, where did that come about? And does that have any significance in the overall world that you are creating? It does. Uh, you know, Invicta, you know, I mean, there's a, a famous quote, Invicta, um, or Roma Invicta, right? Unconquerable Rome. Right. Um, and, and that's sort of the contrast of that statement with that time period where it's kind of collapsing is really what I kind of wanted to bring out. And, and that, the title itself is, you know, Invicta, Fall of Rome. So it's kind of a, 
it's kind of an, an antithesis to itself, right? Like unconquerable, but falling um, at the same time. Um, and that's sort of this, this cognitive dissonance that even the people themselves felt in that era, right? Mm. Where here they were, you know, instilled into them um, almost as we are today, you know, people in, in the, the, the broader West are so instilled with this idea of comfort and, you know, nothing bad can ever happen, you know, collapse seems so far or, or uh, you know, a conspiracy theory. And that's what a lot of Romans thought the same thing. And so that invicta, that, that kind of core belief of, you know, we're unconquerable, um, you know, that, that's kind of where, what I wanted to, that, that kind of dissonance in the thought. But also it is relevant in, in the story and, and the actual cover itself with kind of invicta written in blood in the way it is. Um, has relevance to the story itself, which I won't spoil, but, um, you know, you'll, you'll, as the readers will see, the cover will make sense. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So I can tell that you, as you said earlier, that you have spent years bringing this story to life. And I can imagine, being this is your second story, and one you're very passionate about telling, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy, which I'm sure fans who have been with on me on this journey on my YouTube channel, as well as my podcast before this, writing a story is a very time consuming endeavor and a very lonely endeavor because you are putting hours and hours into a project that you hope gets um, uh, recognition that you hope gets, you know, some readers. It's a very, very time consuming, but very worthwhile endeavor so chris for you when you began writing this what sort of pushed you to not only get this first book done but come to the decision that i want the world to know the history of invictus i want my soon-to-be fans to know this is the world that's going to come about soon what has continued to push you and drive you to tell this story Sure. Well, honestly, some of it was the feedback from my beta readers. You know, they they really it resonated with many of them, and um, because of that, I thought, you know, I think I owe I owe it to the hard work I put into it, um, and the hard work they did, you know, helping me um, to kind of put put it put it forward. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I can't help but um, find that whole time period fascinating in the context of. Um, our current modern world, you know, and not that I'm implying that the modern world is collapsing, but um, there there was a certain element of hubris um, to the Roman Empire that right. I, I often think people today have, you know, where co collapse seems so far and away. I mean, here I am sitting in a, a hotel, right, um, mm -hmm. in the middle of a city that, you know, collapse seems so, like something impossible, you know, and to many Romans it was too. And I, I kind of want people to hopefully draw parallels to, you know, the world back then. And I think a lot of people, even though, you know, we see it in Gladiator and then, you know, we see kind of, and we learn about ancient Rome, um, the quality of life of the average Roman before late antiquity, you know, would not be matched until, you know, the late 20th or the early 20th century. Um, right. If not. And so what I want people to kind of come to terms with the fact is, you know, in the cycle of humanity, you know, there was a certain amount of progress that already happened once, kind of imploded, and then we've been building back since. And so that's sort of that element to it, too, kind of keeps me going. Like, I really want people to see this and, you know, see, you know, I know it's fiction. I realize that. But there's so much built into it from what I read in nonfiction and, and firsthand accounts of, of what, you know, Romans thought back then that, um, you know, I really want people to kind of Hear, hear that story, if you will. Because again, like we said, the fall of Rome is su really such an underexplored time period. You know, people know it fell, people are interested in it, but the actual fall itself is so underexplored, um, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, there'll be more books to come in, in this era. I think that would be fascinating. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, it, it is true. As, as we said in the beginning, like the fall of Rome is a very, very fascinating topic. And there's in a lot of books that have explored the fall of Rome in like different periods, like Valerio Manfredi's The Last Legion, which follows yeah. uh, Romulus Augustulus as like the last emperor of Rome. And yeah. it's then that story that creates the King Arthur myth with the ninth legion in Hispania. You also have uh, the scourge of God, which follows a uh, Roman soldier, or not even Roman soldier, but a uh, Roman ambassador who sort of gets embroiled with Attila the Hun, 
coming to defeat of uh, the Western Empire. There are yeah. so many different stories to explore, whether you want to look at like the politics, the warriors, the warfare, or just like the German perspective or any other perspective. It is very fascinating, which actually needs to suspect that there's been a lot of different, I imagine a lot of different historians that you've had to reference um, in your work to sort of like get like this grand picture. So who to say were like your big uh, influences in terms of gathering uh, sources as well as the retelling of this particular period? Sure. So, uh, you know, I'd have to start with with uh, Gibbons, right? I, I, Gibbons, mm. I, I find, you know, that was the first piece that I read. And I know that much of what, um, much of the historians today say that his outlook is somewhat outdated. Um, I mean, that was kind of for many years, um, the quintessential um, yes. kind of telling of the fall of Rome. Um, and again, his his telling is, is somewhat apocalyptic, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, today and, and, you know, there's some more modern ones that I read that I'll list in a moment. But, um, you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the more modern historians say, you know, that apocalyptic take was very, um, you know, 19th century uh, driven and, and the historiography of it has sort of changed a lot. Right. right. So, um, and I'm cognizant of that. That being said, I, I don't think that his side is entirely wrong. You know, I, I do believe that there's an element of what he has written that is still true. And, and you'll see some of that in the book. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly um, I, I do think that some of what he said um, is not true. Um, some some other authors that I read that non nonfiction authors that I read that kind of inspired me, um, Ralph Whitney Matheson. Um, he wrote a book called Roman Aristocrats in Barbarian Gaul. Um, Ooh, all right. Survival in an Age of Transition. That was That's the title of it. Um, all right. I read that a while ago. I, I highly recommend it for anybody interested in the era. Um, it's really about how, you know, the Gallo-Roman aristocrats who originally were always a little bit of an other in the empire because obviously Gaul got... Um, conquered by Caesar, um, but right. heavily Romanized, you know, in the in the second and third centuries, um, and it's really a fascinating story, uh, uh, kind of write up of what happened in Gaul specifically, right? And, and right, kind of how that and the main character from my book, Invicta, is a, a Gallo-Roman aristocrat. Um, so I kind of took a lot of what I learned from Ralph, Ralph Whitney um, Matheson in there. Um, and so highly recommend that one. Again, that one's called Roman Aristocrats and Barbarian Gaul, Strategies for Survival in an Age of Transition. And that mm -hmm. book, as, as might be indicated by the subtitle, really does not buy into, um, does really not buy into uh, Gibbon's account because he's he calls it a transition, right? He doesn't call it a collapse. So to him, this was really a transitionary era where um, it wasn't like this apocalyptic, suddenly everything collapsed, you know, and uh, it was much more, um, you know, the aristocrats kind of took over a very different role, um, as particularly via the Christ rising Christianity, um, you know, than, than you saw. Right. There. Um, and there was another book, which, you know, I, I, I can send you after this. Uh, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head, which really um, I want to I'm trying to pull up my my Kindle um, library here because it was a while ago that I read it. But it was to the similar effect of, you know, kind of. Christianity, um, uh, really kind of how Christianity transitioned from kind of a mainly uh, pagan um, Roman empire. And I took right. a lot of the lessons from that um, because as you will see, and I don't want to spoil too much, but um, because one of the main characters in Invicta is a demigod from the you know Greek pantheon, those that kind of ancient that that mythology. Right. Um, Christianity is obviously very heavy, heavy by late antiquity, transitioning into the uh, Middle Ages. So I don't want to spoil too much, but how Christianity kind of plays into that mythology and the death of that mythology um, in this kind of fantasy world that I built is is very different from. Um, the reality of the of the real world, but I took a lot of the lessons from that book of you know really a lot of the wealthy Romans and the ideas of Rome kind of just transitioned to the Roman Catholic Church that we know today. Right, a lot of the legacy, and and that's how a lot of Roman culture was ended up being preserved was via the Christian Church and monasteries, and um, you know it was a kind of a 
hey, save what we can via the church because the barbarians aren't going to touch it, right? Because right. they're continuing the Christianity too. Um, so it's really just kind of a really fascinating um, time frame. And, and I, I'll get you the title of that other book. I, I don't want to take up too much time digging for it, but that one's really No worries. <laughs> fascinating. And then kind of like a follow-up question. So those are the sort of like the scholars and the historians who have sort of like molded your historical framework um, in terms of like gathering the sources and like the world you're trying to create in Invictus, very accurate to our own history. Now, what fiction author, authors would you say have been your biggest role models in terms of telling a story as well as character, story structure? What authors have played uh, a role models or role models in that regard? Absolutely. So um, uh, George R. R. Martin was a huge influence on me on how I structured the story with kind of uh, multiple characters and, and multiple viewpoints. Some are, are relatively minor compared to the overall story, but um, you know, the way that they tell the story together, I think I was, I was heavily influenced by that sort of format and structure. Um, you know, I think that as, as far as uh, the main plot, which would be Orpheus's demigod plot, you know, I was very influenced by, um, you know, uh, Campbell's hero's journey um, mm. and, and that sort of, that kind of quintessential journey of, of you know, from the start to finish um, with a unique take, obviously, because it's, it's, there's a, a ensemble kind of ca cast here. So it's not just from Orphe's perspective, um, but you know, the, the, that sort of uh, hero's journey was a ver weighs very heavily. Um, and honestly, I, I know that it's not a, uh, a book um, but you know the whole um, perspective of how um, this fantasy element plays into the larger world. You know, I was kind of influenced by Star Wars as well. Obviously, right. Star Wars itself was heavily influenced by Rome, um, mm -hmm. with the becoming an empire. Um, so some of that, and I'm sure that readers will, will catch on to that as well um, in, in some of the writing. Obviously, this is a lot more grounded than than Star right. Wars. It's not, it's not a science fiction. Um, but you know, some of how that story kind of comes through. Um, you know, you'll see. Um, but as far as this story itself, it was really George R. R. Martin, um, you know, uh, the, the hero's journey. Um, and uh, as for this particular book, I'd say that's it. You know, my, my first book, I have some other influences because it's science fiction. Right. Um, but, you know, obviously there's some of the more Tolkien, of course, you know, I read those once upon a time. I wasn't actively reading them when I wrote this one. Um, but all of that sort of um, those kind of classical fantasy stories um, you know, really played into played into what I I, I built here. Um, nice, very cool. And it actually kind of uh, then leads into the now the more uh, business side of the interview, which is now about publishing. So, Chris, what can you tell us about your experiences um, um, in the publishing world? Are you an independent publisher? Or are you a traditional uh, uh, publisher or traditionally published? I'm independent for both. So I self-published for my, my first science fiction book, as well as this book. Um, I made that decision after, you know, attempting query letters for, for years, mm. um, you know, for my first book. And even before that, I'd written, you know, books prior to the first one that I published, but none of them I would consider good enough to self-publish now. So I, I, right. I um, but I, I attempted query letters, you know, for a better part of 10 to 15 years, just to see you know, mm. what it's about. And um, I was not a fan of it. You know, it just, um, ultimately it's very, it's highly subjective, I feel, you know, even though right. you're told that it's not, it, it is, you know, it's just kind of at the whims of somebody, you catching someone's eye. Um, and so, you know, really as much as uh, I, I don't like all of Amazon's business practices, you know, they've kind of changed the game for self-publishing. And so once KDP came out, um, I made the decision, you know, at some point when I'm ready, I'm going to publish these books, self-publish these books. Come, you know, fast forward 10 years, the self-publishing industry itself has changed a lot. So right. Amazon in the game. Um, and, you know, I, I for my first book, I published via Ingram, Spark, as well as Amazon and, and all the other ebook distributors. I decided to not go um, with KDP Select. Um, which is, you know, the Amazon um, specific e exclusive thing. Um, I decided not to do that. Um, and so, uh, but yes, I'm self-published for both and I intend to continue self-publishing. I, I find it, uh, I have a lot more creative control 
And um, I also just find it a lot more exciting to kind of do all of this myself. And, and frankly, you know, with things like ReadZ and some of these other resources out there, right. you can effectively do all of the work of a big publishing house yourself, as long as you, you know, ha have the capacity to pay for, you know, a cover artist and an editor. Yes. It's not, and which uh, not everyone does, and it's a significant barrier to entry. Um, but if you can, um, you know, the, the possibility is out there to kind of match what a big publishing house does. Um, yes. with the one exception being marketing and being able to get you into the, uh, get you into the books, brick and mortar stores, you know, they, they, won't yes. So. yes. And that's actually very true. And as I'm sure a lot of uh, my viewers who I have seen my other guests who have talked about this, uh, self-publishing does have its benefits, but don't, it also has a lot of things that a lot of authors really need to consider going into this field. Uh, as Chris said, you do have a lot more creative control over your story. You're not the whims of a publishing house, but you have to do the marketing on your own. You have to find a cover artist on your own. You have to find an editor on your own. You have to get the ISBNs on your own. And it is a very, very costly endeavor because yes. it's coming out of your pocket. It's very, very difficult. But as Chris said, there are a lot of tools that help us like Readsy. We just like a perfect platform to get your book started as well as like format, like how many chapters you want, author bios, uh, more about the author, as well as a whole bunch of other uh, indie platforms. Like, of course, Amazon KDP, Barnes & Noble, Google Reads or Goodreads. There's a lot of other platforms. So independent publishing is a good thing, but you do have to do research into this to know if this is what you want to do. So on this question, Chris, going back to your first book, um, your uh, science fiction book, did you do a lot of research into the indie, indie publishing route um, beforehand? Or did you kind of learn um, when you already were in that process, in that mindset? And it was kind of just a snowball effect. So I, I was already decided on self-publishing, but um, I, once I really, I did do a little bit more research because it had changed so much and I just got even more excited to do it. You know, um, 15 years ago when KDP first started or whenever, I don't even remember how long, how long 2011 or something, um, when it first started um, and I first looked into it and I kind of dipped my toes into how does KDP work and should I submit something? Um, you know, the, the, the thought of hiring my own editor, um, finding a cover artist seemed so daunting that it almost seemed like silly, right? Because it was, there wasn't back then a really consolidated location like Reed Z or Fiverr or some of these locations. Um, and the industry hadn't fully acclimated yet, you know, to, right. to this new thing. Um, now you can dig and you'll find that stuff. There's, you know, strategies for authors, you mm -hmm. know, from pr previously successful authors. Um, and, you know, if there's, if there's one advice I would give to other aspiring authors that, that I took heed on is, you know, you, you get into self-publishing, um, you know, as much as you, I'm sorry, you get out of self-publishing as much as you put in to the extent that, you know, um, if you, there's a lot of authors that you read that are, are crushed because they put all this time and effort into this book, they publish it and get, you know, no sales, no, no traction. And it happened to me too, you know, in 2011, when I published one of those really old books that I would never publish. Right. Um, that happened to me as well. And the, the key to it is is the marketing, you know, um, and that's that's where you kind of can change your game, um, and and you can bring people's eyes to it. And honestly, of all of the things that you're going to do with your book, including cover editing, if you choose to do those things, marketing it can be one of the least expensive. You know, um, it doesn't take very much to do ads on Instagram or right. Facebook. Um, you know, it, it it pales in comparison to the cost of an editor. Or, yes. Or these things. Um, so, and, and, you know, let's be real. There's been some pop books that were not very well written that got very big based on marketing. Um, That's true. So, so, you know, it's, it is possible to get eyes on, on your books um, and, and kind of get out there and, and you'll feel a lot better. Um, I, I'm not claiming that you'll ever necessarily get an, a return on investment. Um, and ultimately mm -hmm. this is, this is a, a very expensive hobby, um, you know, really. Um, but, uh, it's, it's still, um, you know, there, there are venues now. And, um, if you are an author and, and you're watching this, um, you know, don't, don't give up and, you know, focus on, on, on strategies 
you know, keep, keep writing, of course, and, and having a big back catalog is, is key to su being successful. But, you know, marketing is a, is a big part of it. And, and think think mm -hmm. even in advance of putting it out there, you know, who who's my target audience? How am I going to reach them? Um, even if there's free ways, just using the right hashtags, right. You know, how can I get out there and, and, you know, or joining the right forums on Reddit and other places mm. so, and getting out there. So. I'm actually glad you brought up the strategies because that actually into two really important questions that I um, did want to ask you, which is um, going back to what you said about, you know, doing a lot more research into your writing, you know, writing, finding your target audience. Because I know I've had a talk with uh, one of my friends, uh, Raven, shout out to her, who is um, the owner of her own publishing house. And he says probably the most dangerous thing for young writers or independent writers is writing for a niche, a trend that's happening. And they try to write the book, they try to speed through it, and they try to get on the shelves, the niche is done. The trend's over. Now the new trend's coming in. And I think it's probably one of the biggest dangers for uh, young, inexperienced, or very green writers when trying to write for trends. So when you uh, were writing two of your books, um, do you just like write and like finish your book when you know it's finished? Or do you try to not be part of like the major trend, but try to see, well, what are the main interests that people are talking about now? Oh, people like fantasy, Game of Thrones, or House of the Dragon. People like um, the Viking show or Last Kingdom. Do you try to write for that kind of target audience where they're like, you know, talking about these genres? Or do you just sit down and make the commitment saying, I'm going to write this book and I'm going to finish it when I'm done. And when I say this is the best work that I can do. Yeah, I, I, it's the latter. Um, I mean, my science fiction comedy book, um, you know, it, it's definitely an off the beaten path book. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that it's something that the industry was or, or the market was clamoring for right now. Um, but I wrote it and, and I, I, I wrote it years ago. Um, but, you know, I, I put it out because I thought it was one of the two most equipped, um, you know, re ready to be released now. Um, and, and I knew it was ready to go, you know, after the editing. Um, Invicta is interesting because I, I started writing this years ago um, and, you know, I, I didn't finish it recently either. I finished it probably two or three years ago um, yeah. and uh, only recently have, you know, once I decided to publish the first book, did I pick Invicta back up and say, you know what, I, I think this one's ready to go too. Um, once, once the editing was complete and, and kind of, you know, putting the, the wrapping on it. Um, but it's just fascinating because um, I, speaking of trends, you know, right now, ancient Rome happens to be in the zeitgeist a little bit just because of that meme that was circulating about um, asking people's uh, husband or man in their life, you know, how, how often they think about ancient Rome. I don't know if you saw that. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I did certainly consider that when I thought about um, a release date um, and I was trying to figure out, can I release it sooner to capitalize on that? But ultimately I decided not to because I needed to give the artists more time to finish the interior design. Um, right. And, cover. and ultimately that's more important, right? You know, I, I could have very easily just stuck it in the Reedsy generator and, and pumped it out and, you know, had a not fully, um, you know, a full product um, to, to kind of keep with that trend, um, which is kind of a microcosm of what you're talking about, right? Like somebody, right. oh yeah, this is trendy right now. Let me quickly write up a book about it. Um, and I, and I kind of got caught in it, you know, uh, not, not with writing it because it's, it, it was years ago I wrote it, but with trying to get it out quicker and, and kind of take shortcuts um, and I had to stop myself. So it's definitely alluring to do that. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, it's fleeting, right? I mean, it's already been two weeks since that happened and, and that trend is basically gone. <laughs> so right. it's, you know, had I rushed it out then, um, I would have had a poorer product for it. And, uh, and you know, it would have been, I, I would have been looking back, think, you know, smacking myself thinking, why didn't I just take the extra time, make sure the interior formatting was good. The cover was where, where I wanted it to be. Um, so it's, it's certainly a cautionary tale. Um, but no, I, I, I don't really write to trends. I write to what, I, what I'm interested in. Um, I mean, this whole thing about the fall of Rome was certainly, I, I mean, at the time that I was writing it, it, it was difficult to get people to kind of listen to me because everybody was like, Rome, yeah, you know, it wasn't, it was years after Gladiator came out. Nobody was really thinking that much. And right. the O show, you know, um, people weren't that interested in it, but I'm just a little bit of a history nerd. So I, I'm always nice. by that stuff. <laughs> And that actually kind of leads into the second part um, of this question, which is, um, as you talked about, you know, you know, you're writing for yourself, like your target audience. 
But from a lot of guests I've, I've talked with, another big important question is when you're writing your voice or getting your author voice out, we tend to be inspired by you know a lot of the authors of that we enjoy. Like as you mentioned, George R. R. Martin was a big influence on Invictus and like storytelling and all that stuff. And sometimes we take away like some of the elements like storytelling structure, how he described characters. And the reason why I bring that up is um, one of my good friends, um, Kim Applegren, a South African author, she's a big fan of Tolkien and her work, The Silent Witness, is very much heavily inspired by um, Tolkien. She was able to make her own language, her own um, world, her own culture, her own religion, everything. And everyone say, you know, she's the next uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. And, you know, we like to hear those things, but then, you know, when I when I jumped in to be part of this uh, writing community and published um, my book, um, The Gathering, which everyone says, you know, you are very descriptive like Tolkien, like C.S. Lewis, and you have this writing style like Rayo Manfredi or uh, Alan Smale, we tend to think, well, I'm not trying to be like these guys. Yes, these guys are a big influence on me, but I'm not trying to be like the next so-and-so. So in your beta readers, going back earlier, has anyone ever uh, commented on that, saying that your style of writing is reminiscent to one of like the great titans of literacy? And if so, um, do you take it as like a compliment or do you take it as like, saying, well, well, thank you, but I'm, I'm not trying to be like so-and-so? Yeah. So, you know, in, in each book, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. So my first book, I was told it sounded very, uh, it, it felt very Douglas Adams. So Hitchhiker's okay. Guide to the Galaxy, um, you know, and at the time I, I didn't really like it because as much as I, I liked his Hitchhiker's Guide, because it's a science fiction comedy like my book, um, my book was much more narrative focus than Hitchhiker's right. Guide to the Galaxy. So to me, it almost felt, you know, am I, have I written something that's too um, wild and bizarre. You know, it's meant to be a comedy, but it's meant to be more in the tune of like Galaxy Quest, right? Like where there's a clear plot, right. a clear structure. Um, it's not meant to be kind of zany. Um, so I see exactly what you're saying. And with this, with Invicta, with the beta readers who read that, um, you know, I, I definitely got a few people that said there were certain scenes and certain elements that definitely reminded them of um, George R. R. Martin, um, and they, you know, they would call out specific things like, wow, this felt very, you know, this moment felt very Game of Thrones. Um, and, you know, to your point, I kind of second guessed those scenes and I would think, well, right. you know, we include it. And, you know, what's interesting is one of them that they mentioned this about is a real life scene that actually happened. Because <laughs> um, there is some, you know, there are some real characters in the book too. It's not all, all fantasy characters. Right. And there's a particular scene, which you'll know when you read it, um, this actually happened, and they actually have the quotes from um, the two figures, the historical figures of, of what they say in the moment, and I, I integrated that into the story. Um, and somebody said, this feels very uh, Game of Thrones, and it kind of, to me, was like, well, you know, it's funny, but sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, right? I mean, this, right. this actually happened as it played out here. Um, obviously, I took some liberties because nobody was in the room. Um, nobody right. Nobody was alive who was in the room. Um, so we don't know certainly what happened, but we know somewhat. Um, but, you know, that that kind of made me feel a little bit better knowing that, you know, this was a real scene. So the fact that that feels Game of Thrones, you know, it, it's not as relevant to me because that, that this is something that actually happened. And, um, you know, I can I can pull up the Wikipedia page and say, look, here's exactly what <laughs> what how this happened. Um, but also, you know, the world is kind of a brutish place. And that's kind of one of George R. R. Martin's, uh, you know, staples was kind of, you know, how um in depth and, and how, uh, how you know, oftentimes certain characters, you know, nothing good would happen to them, you know, even though they, it, they, there wasn't that like relief of, oh, thank God, you know, we've, we've gotten over right. the end and it feels so good to have this, uh, you know, um, in the denouement, everybody kind of gets happy and um, not every character gets that for George R. R. Martin. And um, yeah, that is true. Yeah. And that certainly doesn't happen for ancient Rome. Right. I mean, we know that what happens is gone. <laughs> so right. you know, some of the characters and some of the elements in this, and that's almost unintentional. You know, George R. R. Martin was a huge inspiration for me. But at the end of the day, you know, no matter what I do, this is a historical fantasy. Ancient Rome is going to fall. You know, I'm not going right. to. Right. So, to a certain element, you know, there's there's not going to be that that feel good moment for for every character and every element. Um, so, I, I definitely got some of that. But I, I think that um, I I see your point. I definitely second guessed myself a few times when I got that feedback. Um, but ultimately, you know, I, I think that 
I, I think it's a little humbling too. You know, if somebody reads something and says, wow, this sounds just like something I read in somewhere else. I mean, that's obviously a published book that they read. So it was good enough to, to get out there. As long as they're not saying it sounds too much like it. Um, right. Where it's, you know, copying, that, then that would stress me out. But I hadn't gotten that feedback yet. I, I know the feeling. When I actually began writing my first book, uh, The Gathering, I would it was probably back in like 2020. I began writing this actually earlier, back in 2018. And as almost like you, um, I started writing this. I put away for a little bit. And back in 2020, I was in master's school. I decided I might as well just write because, of course, uh, the lockdown happened. And then everything went on digital, went remote. And I need something to keep busy. So I started writing with that. And when I started posting it online, people were saying, oh, wow, this is this is really good. Because almost like you, my thing is like a mixture of history and fantasy, seven characters from history taken from pivotal battles in earth across time are sent to this alien world that now have to fight a way to get back. And everyone said, this is amazing. Your description of battles are very, very um, vivid. My little secret always I tell them is I watch YouTube videos of movie battles and I just listen to the sounds and imagine what the battles are like. It's one of the little things I do, but and everyone's saying, you know, C.S. Lewis or Tolkien. I was like, well, thank you. I appreciate the comments, but, you know, I, I'm, I can't imagine myself ever being like them because I'm, I'm still trying to find my craft. I'm still trying to find my voice. And it is a humbling feeling to, like, to have, like, all these fans who really enjoy our stories. So that kind of leads into the next few questions before we get into, like, the final part of the interview, um, which is, uh, Chris, um, for you, who have been your uh, biggest supporters? Oh, man. Um, I mean, definitely my wife has been a huge supporter of mine. Um, you know, and once she saw, for example, the first book, when, when we, we got it published on Ingram Spark and the, and the paperback came, you know, and it felt real, um, you know, she really kind of was very supportive at that point. Um, but also, you know, some, some of my best friends who have read my books from the beginning, I mean, even when they were much, much earlier like pre-beta readers, right? Like alpha readers. Oh, okay. Um, some of those people um, have been with me the whole time, kind of even helping me think of further ideas. Um, so really it's been, you know, friends and family have been kind of the, the core. Um, obviously I, I haven't published anything before these two books and, and the first book I published only in January. So um, I don't have a big established base of, of readers to kind of keep me, keep me going. Um, so I'm very thankful that, you know, my family and my friends have been there to to really keep pushing me um, because without them, you know, it would be, you know, I'm putting stuff out into the void and, and you know, right. there's not a lot of feedback. Um, but certainly, you know, in, in both of my online communities on um, Instagram and Facebook, I have a page for both book series. Um, and, and in both of them, I, I now have, um, you know, a very passionate um, core group of fans who are, you know, very excited. Um, and, and that keeps me going too. And, and, you know, if there's any other authors watching this, once that happens, you, you feel so good. You know, once, once you start to, you know, see people, um, you know, take interest in it, who you don't know at all, and, um, you know, start to get excited about plot points and things like that. Um, it really makes it all worth it. <laughs> all the nice. Things. I completely know the feeling. It's always good to have like that core group of people that are really supportive of our work and love the stories that we have and are just there for us when we're just like have like our our off days and like give us uh support and sort of like the last question before we get into the final segment which is have you ever had like a moment of like validation from like beta readers or even like fellow authors online like on instagram and facebook who read a blurb of your story and said this is good you definitely belong in this community or do you not seek uh, validation uh, for your uh, writing in the sense that you don't write simply for validation? You like when, you know, you get validation for your work, but you don't go out actively to seek it. I, excuse me. I, I definitely don't go out seeking it, but I do. I mean, like anyone else, I do enjoy it. Um, I mean, it, it, it does help me feel like it's all worth it, you know? Um, to, not more so than just my own, you know, hobby enjoyment of writing. Um, right. The fact that someone else could enjoy, even if they haven't read it yet, just the blurb. Um, yourself included, right? You know, before you invited me on here, um, mm -hmm. you know, I that that element of wow, this blurb sounds really cool. Um, you know, you, you've you've made something that I am interested in reading more about. Definitely. Um, you know, that that in and of itself is is a powerful motivator. 
you know, and while I don't write just for that, um, it really helps keep me going. And um, I'm sure you as an author know too, you know, when you get those reviews in, yes. um, it's like a tip, right? It's like a tip for an mm -hmm. author, just keep, keep going. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, while I don't write for that alone, um, it certainly uh, decreases the barrier to entry to writing more. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so now we're now nearing the, or should I say, we're now in the final segment of the interview. And so like the last major and probably most important question is we've yeah. already been given um, the answer already to this, but what other words of wisdom would you give to young um, authors out there who want to transition from writing as a hobby to now writing as a business? Yeah. Um, I, I only recently learned this lesson. So take it with a huge grain of salt, but um, you know, when you're transitioning from writing as a hobby to writing as a business, you know, the, the core thing to remember is you're, if you're treating it like a business, your book is a product, right? Um, and that's that you just have to kind of wrap your head around that. Your book is very, it's a very personal thing. And I know that, um, you know, these, these words that I've written are very personal and, mm -hmm. you know, even, you know, on my car ride here, I was, you know, still thinking about it sometimes because you, you, this, this world that you've created and you're thinking about the characters, um, but once you put it out there and, and you, you have the goal of uh, publishing, it becomes a product. And when you think of it in those terms, packaging is important to a product. Right. How you price it is important to a product. How, you know, everything about that, the marketing around that is important to that product. Um, so it becomes no different than selling um, a car or selling, mm -hmm. you know, anything else. It's, you know, you, you want to put something out there that people are going to look at and think, I want to, you know, spend money on that. Or even if it's free, even if it's a free book, I want to spend time reading that. Right. Because right. um, ultimately time is money, right? People spending mm -hmm. time reading your book, that's time they could be doing something else. So right. even if you're not putting it for sale, because a lot of authors don't, um, you still want to commit people to, or you still want to get people to say, wow, that's something I want to spend time doing is reading that. Um, and so just think of it like that. Your book is a product um, and, and you'll, that, that'll help kind of kind of take the switches in your brain and, and everything will start to fall in place. Like, okay, well, is my product ready for launch? You know, you're thinking of it like almost like an iPhone or <laughs> something like that. Is this ready for launch? You know, are people going to find right. bugs, right? Typos, they're like bugs in the software. So just th think of it like that and, and um, it'll start to all come together, the puzzle pieces. No two words ever spoken. Very, very true, Chris. Very, very true. And with that, listeners, we will conclude this wonderful interview with Chris. Before we officially end it, I want to say thank you to Chris for joining us today. Th Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, where can people find and follow you to engage with you as well as learn new updates about Invictus? So I would definitely follow my Instagram at Invicta Series. Um, that's where I'm posting all of the major updates for the Invicta book. Um, I do also have a, an author Instagram, I'm sorry, an author uh, X now, it's not Twitter anymore, X, uh, called at um, C, uh, C Hackett Writes. Um, you can also find me on there. Um, I don't only post about writing on there. I occasionally post about my day job too. So you might find that boring. Um, and, you know, Invicta is releasing October 27th on uh, ebook and paperback. So, um, but you can check the, the Instagram for updates. Awesome. I'll make sure to... Uh, put those down in the description below for you to check out uh, Chris's uh, socials. I urge you all to go and check out Invictus. I saw the cover when it was the transition to the final product. The final cover looks amazing. It's awesome. I can't wait for it to come out. And as many as you know, I love history. I love that period. And it kind of correlates to my own book when writing my own history, which is Aminus, Son of Persia, which is also out on paperback and ebook. It's an amazing story, almost kind of the lines of Chris's story, Invictus. It is a historical fiction story with a little bit of fantasy elements that balance it out. So go and check both of those out because I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. Well, listeners, I hope you enjoyed this wonderful author interview. Again, I want to thank Chris for joining us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris, and telling us all about Invictus, your writer's journey, and what we can expect going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.
And listeners, be on the lookout for upcoming episodes, Fellow Historians Lounge for next month, as well as future episodes down the road. Well, this concludes our interview. This has been The Wandering Scribe and The Wandering Quill, signing out.